morning, uh, everybody. Um, so first of all, thank you to AAVP for, uh, for inviting us. Today we want to present a review of and a framework for the study of early and later hominins and Paleolithic in the Low Countries. And this will, of course, be not so much on bones, although you see one here, because we simply have to gut that many. Uh, but rather on their context and the potential and characteristics of that context. And the major point we want to underline is that we should not focus only on land-based research, but integrate data from what is now the North Sea. And finally, although I'm presenting alone here, Kjell Düsseldorf is sitting right there and he's agreed to answer all your difficult questions. Um, in this talk, we'll present an overview of the history of land and sea-based research and recent finds. And we want to underline differences and commonalities between these two data sets and try to begin to understand how they may be integrated. The main problem with the Paleolithic is that there's not much to go on. Paleolithic sites on land are few and in the North Sea they are even more difficult to get at. So we have a puzzle with a lot of pieces missing and therefore there's also a plea to use all the pieces we have. Especially because we're dealing with one big Pleistocene landscape which only during the Eemian uh, saw uh, water levels in the North Sea the same or even beyond those of today. So we're dealing with one big land mass from Poland to the Pennines. Um, so we should also try and understand this landscape as a whole because uh, also for hominins it was just one big area where they uh, would shame happen. But first, let's take a step back and see how the Paleolithic research in the Netherlands uh, came about. Clearly this began in the 19th century. This morning John de Vos already mentioned the important discovery of warm and cold fauna at uh, Tegelen where Dubois was also involved. But another important discovery was the Nianto skull in Angers although it wasn't recognized as such, and by the time it was, uh, Belgium was no longer part of the Netherlands, so we missed out on the first Neanderthal. Um, but later on they found another one at speed. So these were important discoveries, but lots of Paleolithic finds were eyes actually isolated uh, uh, occurrences. And the reason for that is that uh, for a long time in the 20th century, researchers actually didn't think there were a lot of paleo landscapes in the Netherlands that would actually harbor uh, intact sites, because finds were often done on the surface, in river deposits, from ice to ridges, so we didn't have a lot of context. And also in this early period, the whole Paleolithic debate was tainted somewhat by the Romanian affair, a really enthusiastic amateur archaeologist who found a lot of uh, Paleolithic finds and sites, but many uh, from them uh, uh, appeared to be forgeries in the end, so that really uh, drove a wedge between the amateur and professional world. So it wasn't until the 1980s that actually integrated Paleolithic research began with excavations at Maastricht Belvedere where for the first time Neanderthal landscapes were really documented, uh, how, uh, how these uh, hominids used tools uh, alongside the river, uh, how they butchered animals and it also yielded data for uh, uh, the early occupation of Europe. Uh, during the Salian and Waxelian in general. And additional sites were discovered in Limburg, just across the border at Feldbezel and Kessel. Um, but those were the big excavations, and over the last couple of years, uh, most uh, Paleolithic research on land has been rather small scale. Uh, recently, Marcel Nikas uh, discovered and excavated a Neanderthal butchering camp near Asse, and uh, for the first time in commercial archaeology, two Paleolithic sites were discovered again in Limburg near Heerlen. The problem is, this is very much a lithic story because conservation conditions for fauna are not that great on land. Uh, we do have some, uh, for instance, while building the high-speed railroad line near Leiderdorp, a uh, mammoth bone with cut marks was found and uh, recently uh, in a parking construction of a parking garage in Den Bosch, uh, actually, uh, 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 fauna, uh, Pleistocene fauna was found as well as artifacts dating to about 70,000 uh, BP. Only the trouble is, commercial archaeology, you work within time frames, so there was not enough time to really excavate this properly. You could rather say it was more or less uh, sampling of that site. So we don't really know whether all of the fauna is in fact in association with uh, the artifacts. Uh, also, and um, John Voss also mentioned this this morning, in deep quarries we do find uh, tools and fauna, uh, also very early, of earlier periods, including uh, the Acheulean, and of course the problem there is uh, context. So if we sum that up, uh, then there are certain benefits to land-based Paleolithic excavation. We have a certain measure of stratigraphic control, we have dating options, and we can follow up on accidental discoveries, but we have little organic preservation, and therefore lack 
a lot of ecological and subsistence information, except in some isolated instances, but their stratigraphic control, etc., is very difficult. And here you see the Netherlands at the start of the Holocene, and you understand why so much of potentially interesting deposits, yeah, they are buried very deep in the west of the Netherlands. But it's not the only thing we have. Let us now turn to the North Sea, or where there's now a North Sea. Uh, the realization that this was not always the case also started in the 19th century. For instance, with Clement Reed in the UK, he uh, uh, described the drowned forests on the, on the UK coast, and also predicted that humans may have lived in those landscapes. Lyle did the same for the Cromer forest beds, uh, and at, at already for uh, quite some time, fishermen in the UK and in Netherlands were, of course, bringing up all kinds of Pleistocene fossils. So the realization grew that uh, there was a vast landscape out there, and also that it was occupied by hominids. One of the first finds was actually this Lehman and Elwell Bank harpoon, which was found in, in 1931. So it really got the thought going that we were dealing with a, a potentially interesting drowned landscape. Um, knowledge of that drew also in tandem with knowledge of uh, climate research and the realization that, as I said, only during the Eemian, uh, uh, the water reached uh, current levels and beyond. And for the rest of that time, uh, this was a vast dry uh, valley where the important rivers of the Thames, the Rhine and Meuse uh, ended up in. Uh, but also in the beginning, this was very much also seen as a land bridge, something you could reach the continent or the UK from. Um, more than an area in its own right, and we are now gradually appreciating it more for what it is instead of a connecting piece only. Uh, and information grew further because there's a very uh, enthusiastic group of collectors who uh, find a lot of finds from uh, beaches, but also go by all the harbors and uh, uh, collect uh, uh, fossil Pleistocene bones. Uh, they were targeted fossil uh, collection expeditions by museums, and over time a good idea grew of important fossil locations, such as the Brown Bank, the Eurogoli, uh, the Dogger Bank, uh, etc. Um, but what was still lacking uh, it was that uh, much, much uh, effort went into documenting this, uh, this Pleistocene fauna and past environment, but there was not that much to go on for uh, 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 past population for actually hominids in that area. And one of the problems is that in fisher nets, these small artifacts or smaller bones, uh, yeah, they slip through the mazes of the net. So uh, uh, it's not an ideal way of catching uh, hominids and artifacts. But for the past 30 or 40 years, it's especially uh, sand suppletion and the aggregates industry that has changed that to a great amount. If you see uh, sand being rainbowed on the beaches and uh, uh, gravel being collected from the seabed. And that really is adding a lot to our information uh, right now. So uh, one of the bigger discoveries in 2007 was the haul of 28 hand axes. You know, hand axes are the Swiss army knives of, uh, of the uh, early army, especially uh, Neanderthal and uh, slightly before that. And they were found, found in a very small area. Um, there's a downside to the story, because when this was discovered by uh, an amateur paleontologist actually looking for fossil bones, he saw these beautiful symmetric objects and he thought, well, let's, let's take them home as well was that uh, the war eventually forbade amateurs to further look uh, uh, at, their, uh, at their heaps uh, because English heritage, following up on this, uh, protected that area for a while to do research there. And of course, you get a conflicting interest between economics and, uh, and research. Uh, but the positive side is that uh, uh, there was a follow-up research and they used grab samples to actually uh, document the area where uh, the hand axes came from and it appeared to be uh, a river valley and during this grab something they even uncovered uh, another hand axe. So this brought home the realization that we're not dealing with isolated finds and pieces of bone laying in, uh, in the North Sea bed but actually with intact paleo uh, landscapes which can yield potentially a lot of information. What was still missing from that was of course uh, uh, the hominid itself. Well, that changed in, in 2001 when uh, one of these ships dredging for shell, which they used for uh, cat litter and, and building material, actually found a very nice piece off the coast of Zeeland in the Zeeland Ridges area. And it's this piece. It's the right parietal bone, frontal bone of, uh, of a Neanderthal. And you see this very uh, uh, characteristic thick eyebrow ridge, 
Well, uh, the paleontologist that discovered it had it in his rubble boxes. Somebody else discovered it in there, and then it got uh, uh, going from uh, Patrick Samal of uh, Brussels Institute to World War Books and Georges Arcoublet, where the piece was further investigated. And this, this following slide showed the potential of uh, uh, what evidence from the North Sea can do. Uh, the problem was there was not enough collagen in the bone to uh, get at the 14 C date. So what they did was look at uh, the fauna that was present in spoil heaps at the wharf, and there were two faunas. One was an early Pleistocene uh, or lower Pleistocene fauna with a, a southern mammoth, with a, a saber-toothed cat, uh, with mastodon, very heavily uh, mineralized, and another one was the typical uh, uh, Pleistocene uh, uh, mammoth step fauna with woolly rhinoceros, woolly mammoth, uh, uh, cave lion. This is of course not a cave. This is a cold lion, not a not a cave lion. Um, and uh, this was less mineralized. And based on mineralization, this piece far better fits this second group, uh, which also co-occurs with the dispersal of Neanderthals around that time and dates the piece roughly between 90 and 35,000 years ago. Um, is that enough? Maybe not, but it is very convenient that at the same time, from the same area, uh, a lot of artifacts dating to the same period uh, were also dredged up from the water, including these uh, uh, very lovely hand axes. Um, but still, as I said, there was not enough collagen in the bone to say it was a Neanderthal. So what they did at the Max Planck Institute, they took uh, 3D morphometric measurements, so they very precisely measured this uh, a piece of bone, and they did the same for skulls of modern uh, uh, modern humans, modern humans from the Paleolithic, uh, other Neanderthal skulls, and early hominid skulls. And it appeared that the Zealand Bridges fossil uh, fitted this red block very well, and that is the typical range for Neanderthal fossils. And it is 3,000 times more likely it is a Neanderthal than a very robust uh, 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 and a modern human. And uh, what they also could do was that there was enough uh, uh, material, uh, collagen material, to do stable isotope analysis. Uh, nitrogen and carbon may be informative on the diet, and they did that for the, this fossil as well. And it indicated that this was a hardcore carnivore. Uh, and that is something that is typical for Neanderthals. We long thought they were scavengers, uh, maybe could get a, get a hold of a rabbit, which I think is also very difficult. But uh, uh, recently, or actually over the past 10, 20 years, it has uh, come to light that these were hardcore meat eaters. Of course, they ate also other food sources, fish and plants, but more, uh, usually more than 50% of the diet is composed of, of this highly energetic food, uh, which is meat. And this was the same for this small piece of skull. And uh, a last finding was that there was a, an odd cavity uh, just behind the eyebrow ridge, and uh, here you see a, a section of it. Uh, this is the scar which was left by a, 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 an intradiploic epidermal cyst. Didn't know that before uh, as well. But that's a, a subcutaneous tumor. Um, probably Neanderthal didn't, uh, didn't die from it, but he could have suffered from headaches and nausea. And of course, that's also not convenient when you're chasing a uh, woolly rhinoceros. But he probably didn't die from it. It's the first time this was discovered in, uh, in Neanderthal. And of course, that was the way uh, our Belgian colleagues uh, presented our first Neanderthal. Not that it was the first Dutch Neanderthal, but that it had a tumor. And they really tried their best to find the most ugly uh, <laughs> reconstruction of a Neanderthal. I don't know why. Um, anyway, this goes to show that uh, the North Sea, even in small finds, has a lot of potential. Here you see the piece being presented by our Minister of Culture, Plaster Ekbagan. He's, he's on the right, piece of skull is on the left. Um, and you see that. Um, it went all over the world. And the message isn't this is the first Neanderthal from the Netherlands, but the message is this is the first Neanderthal from the North Sea, bringing home this important message of this huge fossil and uh, context archive we have in front uh, of our coast. And uh, to match the Lord Kipanitsu reconstructions, this is what uh, we uh, had made by the Kenneth and Kenneth brothers. We called them Krein, which is a name from Zealand, it's a province in front of which it was found, and it also refers to cranium, which is of course a skull, and uh, it was a, a skull piece. So it looks a bit like Santa Claus, but um, it's really uh, become an individual and, and a symbol for the importance of this North Sea uh, uh, heritage. Okay, um, but that is not all there is to it. Uh, the hand axes and uh, this piece of bone are really just 
the really tip of the iceberg. And here you see, I already mentioned it, ships rainbow and sand on the beaches. Uh, here you see uh, the second mass factor, in which you may go on an excursion tomorrow. And you see the Zandmoot near the Hague, uh, an area where the beach is naturally uh, 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 refreshing itself. Uh, but also, every year, 20 million cubic meters of sand are deposited on Dutch beaches. And uh, an enormous amount of fines is in there, and we are now only gradually learning uh, what that all is. And uh, also because many of the collectors started out as uh, fossil collectors for the Pleistocene, and as archaeologists we've been very late in, in uh, um, also uh, helping them uh, uh, learn what to look for uh, if you want to have signs of human presence. Uh, and here you see what they come up with. These are some uh, flakes and bifacial uh, uh, tools from uh, the Bada Island, Tesla Vilum. But this lovely little walk was found a couple of months ago. This Mysterian uh, uh, scraper was found a couple of days ago. And yesterday, this other bifacial scraper was found on the mass market. So it's, it, it's a hit almost every week. And it, this, uh, uh, of course, the problem is these things are slightly out of context, but they give us a, give us a lot of material to, to work with. And not only for the Middle Paleolithic, this is the Late Paleolithic, uh, of course, uh, still a, a dry area, and we now have, uh, we already have this Lehman and Owen Bank points, which dates to the period. We now have uh, uh, what may be the oldest modern man of the, of the Netherlands, dating to around 11,000. We're submitting a paper on that now, together with a decorated uh, metatarsal of a, of a bovid, also dating to 11,000. You see this lovely decoration on the side of it. The next parallel is in Kendrick's cave in, in Wales, somewhere around here, and in France. So we don't have a lot for this period as a whole, so the North Sea can provide important information for this period. And it also goes for uh, the Mesolithic, where we now have a lot of uh, locations where material is uh, uh, coming up from, and then we're not dealing with a stable landscape anymore, but with a drowning landscape, especially after 6500 BC, the sea levels rise uh, uh, in 200 years, 5 meters, so that's an enormous uh, uh, change in landscape, um, and you see this here, how quickly in, within 5000 years this area is drowning. We have a lot of finds from the Mesolithic, you see these uh, bone and antler points, we almost have a thousand or maybe even over a thousand right now, and we are gradually also getting a grip on, on cultural aspects. For instance, this core axe taken to the Mesolithic <coughs> was found in the center of the North Sea, but it looks much more like the core axes we find in the Thames Valley uh, than, than, it does, than it does compared to the ones we find in the Netherlands. So we're gradually getting a grip on maybe cultural zones, etc. And also for the Mesolithic, a lot of human remains uh, appear on the beaches, and we are now, we've now submitted an article that dates these, but also looks at uh, stable isotopes. And it uh, turns out that a lot of these people were actually had an aquatic diet. We have some terrestrial diets, some marine diets, but most of them are aquatic. And that is nice because there's a lot of research into the North Sea right now, but the old picture was this is a drowning area. Uh, people had to more or less run from the water, but we're now actually seeing they stayed where they were and they made the best of this changing, very rich aquatic landscape they were in. Of course, context is a problem. Sometimes, such as here as the Yangtze Harbor uh, near uh, the second mass doctor, there were excavations also with graph sampling, and we can make comparisons with weapon sites uh, on land, such as Harnsfeld, but it, that's, that remains a bit of a difficult aspect of, uh, of these finds, of course. But if we sum up, then we're dealing with largely complementary records. We have on land uh, stratigraphic context, spatial information, behavioral information, but the sea provides organic preservation and a larger ecological context, so they're both very important uh, data sets. And uh, what it does more, the North Sea provides with a very big ecological database. Of course, it's a pain test ecological database, but within that, there's a lot of information. Uh, for instance, on the temporal and geographical aspects of species ranges. Uh, for instance, uh, for uh, the saber-toothed cat, the homotherium, there are now dates that dated much younger than was previously thought. But also for cave lion uh, and cave bear and hyena, uh, to what extent is cave still applicable in an area where we should wonder whether there are indeed caves? Um, and another thing is these lovely 
uh, round lumps. Uh, several dozens have been found now, also in the second mass after these are hyena coprolites, and because they eat so many bones, hyenas, uh, pollen get preserved in them, and they form an important ecological uh, uh, data set for this period. But also, this is then not coming from the North Sea, but the interaction between hominids and fauna, cut marks, or uh, even a piece of flint wedged into what is probably uh, the bone of a beaver. Uh, other studies, uh, this, this is a study into uh, measles wear on teeth of reindeer, indicate that the grey ones are from the North Sea, that there's different processes going on between uh, faunas from the North Sea compared to faunas from other areas, and the same has been done for, for instance, body temperatures of, uh, of including uh, mammoth. So um, the North Sea is providing a huge data set to do this type of research on. Still, we should be aware not to think too much in the colonies because it's not land-based excavations and, and the, the, the counterpart in the North Sea, because we should probably also have these types of sites buried beneath uh, this very subsident landscape in the west of the Netherlands, underneath all these thick Holocene deposits. And a nice example of that is actually happening on the other side of the channel, uh, near Pakefield and Haysboro, where we have coastal erosion, which really sucks if you live here but um, it's really nice when you're an archaeologist because then you can do these types of excavations. Actually, on the coast, they're excavating a very uh, land-related boreal landscape uh, dating to the lower uh, uh, Pleistocene, which yielded all these spines and uh, faunal material as well. Um, and on the other hand, we do find on-land signs, which uh, at that time were actually in a coastal location, such as here at Boxgrove. So, the picture is, is more complex, but in both locations there are uh, sites and landscape that inform us on, on different uh, Paleolithic and Pleistocene contexts. So, uh, to round up, one of the important things is that, that we should look at the area as a whole. This is important for Pakefield and Haysville because they're very early sites, uh, um, and uh, we find most of them on this side of the channel and far less on the continent, and is that uh, something which is mainly a question of dispersal, or is it a question of uh, taphonomy and, and uh, didn't, don't we get at these sites uh, on the continent? In reverse, for the Emian, we uh, have uh, very little evidence on this side of the channel and uh, much more on, uh, uh, on the continent. And is that because of a land bridge disappearing, or again because of taphonomy and dispersal patterns? And the North Sea is one of the most important areas present where we can research this. So you see that continental Neanderthal, you see an earlier variant, um, because of the Brexit, I, I chose a very ugly uh, homo erectus. Um, and it doesn't go for a larger paleo landscape, it also goes for more the, the regional information. If you go back to uh, the Zealand Ridges Neanderthal, it was found near here, and because we have also a very large data set with uh, corings from the geological surface, a service, but also from uh, 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 commercial companies, we can reconstruct those landscapes. And it appeared that this is actually lying in a zone which is very much a fluvial landscape uh, in uh, the first part of the last 100,000 years. Uh, and uh, after heading to the Pliny Glacial, these terrace landscapes uh, were preserved because the rivers cut themselves into the landscape. So we're dealing with a very much intact paleo landscape with a typical riverine situation here, which lies preserved in the landscape because eolian deposits were placed on top of it later on. And that very much looks like the Belvedere quarry on land. So we can use both data sets to compare them, but also to predict what kind of sites we may find in, uh, in what area. Okay, um, to sum up, there is uh, a lot of, of future potential, and I think that especially for uh, uh, the North Sea, that this is the part that is, uh, that is now uh, not so much known and where we should put uh, a lot of effort in. And that is what we're doing these days. We're trying to educate also a lot of uh, fanatic uh, amateurs to look for and, and find uh, remains of, uh, of hominids and, and uh, human occupation in artifacts. Um, because there's a huge area out there which we should sample and we should also publish about it, not only for a scientific reason, but also for a heritage and a, and a perspective agenda, because actually this is sucked up and sprayed on beaches and very little effort goes into preserving and researching sites uh, in the North Sea uh, where they're lying right now. So uh, uh, in the end, uh, I think we hope to demonstrate that Paleolithic research in the Netherlands is far from, from being finished, 
many aspects of thought with difficulties, taphonomic difficulties, but also uh, commercial archaeology is not always proven the ideal partner. Um, but there is a lot of uh, information uh, uh, present, especially uh, uh, in the North Sea. And really, uh, our task for the future is to integrate uh, uh, those data sets, especially because we are in the Netherlands a fringe area and important information for hominid dispersal patterns are present in this area and the North Sea is one of the most important locations to uh, discover that. Okay, that was it. Thank you for your attention.